Did you ever wonder how long it actually takes to make a wheel? Why we make a wheel in some sizes and not others? And do wheel companies really try to copy each other? I'm Scott Weiss and I'm the president of Koenig and today I'm gonna to kind of peel back the curtain and give you kind of the honest look about what it actually takes to make a wheel, what kind of things go into making a wheel and why some of the results that you see on our website when we're finished may be the reason that they are. All right, so let's start at the beginning. When we start making a wheel, we kind of peel back all the roadblocks and we try not to look at them. We try just to make a cool wheel or make a wheel that we have some sort of idea or inspiration on. We continuously try to make wheels throughout the entire year. So we don't ever stop and say, all right, we finished our wheels for next year. We'll just not make anything to the following year comes by. We are constantly making wheel designs we have some wheel designs that we have plans to put out two or three years from now, which is difficult because there's always that trend or timing thing. However, when you look at a brand and we have to consider all the wheels that we make, you can't make seven different 10 spoke wheels, right? You can't put them all out at the same time. So we have to think about it a little bit more in the type of product that we have and are we duplicating ourselves? We may come up with a design that we really love but it just feels too similar to maybe something else that we already have. I think one of the most difficult pieces when we're making a wheel is not only trying to make something that looks cool, but trying to make something that we not only believe in and we would want to run on our own cars, but keeping the DNA of the brand into the design. It's really easy to, I think, look around and see a lot of other wheel brands or a lot of other wheel companies making designs and want to pick up some of the things you think are the coolest points that they have and kind of modify it. It just doesn't work that way. You can't retain your own DNA if that's your approach. So a lot of times we have to do our best to not look at any wheels, which is extremely difficult, especially since we're car enthusiasts, because we like to go to car shows and we like to you know, hang out with our friends and not everybody's gonna run our wheels and we're okay with that, but it means that we're gonna see a lot of other wheels that are on the market. And there's a lot of other things that certainly look cool. There's no reason for me to tell you that I'm not a fan of some other wheel designs that are out in the market. It's just the way it is. If you're not a car person, I guess it wouldn't affect you. But for me, I can appreciate everything that's automotive, especially some of the stuff that we don't make. In fact, that's what I think actually makes us better a lot because we're conscious of they do this and we do that and let's stay in our area. So it's like, how do you push the boundaries without getting outside of the lines? So a wheel has to be more than just style. And it's true, one of the biggest, most primary functions that we're trying to do is make a wheel look good. But in the other respect, it has to be functional and it has to work. And that means we have to meet things like load rating. We have to make sure that the wheel is gonna be strong, have extra rigidity, that it's gonna be something that will hold up for a long amount of time. So to do that, we have to think about its longevity. How will the metal respond? And how will this design transmit stress through different parts of the wheel. So there's a lot that goes into this stage and this can all trump the actual look of the wheel. So let's say when we're in the creative process, we've come up with this incredible looking wheel. When we start to put these details into the wheel's design, we may find ourselves in a situation where we know that the wheel is not gonna be able to be manufacturable. This could be a point where the wheel actually dies and we have to move on and really just start all over again. It can't be modified. It's hard to explain why this happens. Uh, you would constantly think that maybe you can just go back and make something thicker or change the material or change the way the spoke. But when you do, a lot of times you're essentially killing the essence of the wheel. And as soon as you do that, you're kind of getting a watered down version. And a lot of times if you're doing that this early in the process, it's better just to kill the wheel and start all over again. Once we kind of get in through this part where we've done some of this engineering, we're gonna start beginning the first types of FEA. And for those that don't know what FEA is, it basically stands for finite element analysis. And what we're gonna do here is use a computer aided model to essentially simulate stress and different forces on the design and kind of see how it translates and transmits throughout the wheel design. Now, sometimes we're able to tweak different portions of the wheel to make this better. In other words, if we see that, you know, when a wheel is impacted or twisted or uh, enters, enters into a bending test, uh, we see part of the wheel becomes a little bit uh, less strong or it doesn't have enough rigidity. Sometimes we can add material, we can add radiuses, we can do some really cool things that can help 
aid this and improve the FEA test. But then there's other times that we'll find that there's really not much we can do without either making the wheel too heavy or totally changing the design. So we end up having to scrap it right here. So this whole process that we've done so far, it may be great as far as the look of everything, but really could come down to, it's just not something that we can make or we're gonna have to start all over again to kind of try to get there in a different direction. You know, the other thing that engineering really has come a long way with is the technology. We have access to more complex analysis software than we've ever had before. Things like 3D printers, 3D scanners, all these things allow us to really encompass different brakes uh, to make sure that we're using the right contours and radiuses. It allows us to see what wheels will look like before we ever go through the process of making them or developing tooling for them. And that is something that makes it so that we can obsess over every little radius, fillet, contour of a wheel to really increase the strength and rigidity, increase the longevity of a wheel, and make a wheel that's better than it's ever been before. That's why I think when people say, um, you know, what makes some brands better than the other, I believe so much of that uh, when it comes to wheels has to do with the engineering because that's where we spend an enormous amount of time trying to get all the details right and that's going to make a better a better end product so when it comes down to developing wheels i think one factor that you know we have to look at that maybe you don't have to think about so much has to do with cost when it gets into manufacturing there's going to be a lot of different things that will actually affect the end cost of a wheel before we even talk about just the aluminum that it takes to make it and the different materials that it costs to box it, paint it, all that stuff, and then get it over here or be able to produce it in your location. How does cost have anything to do with weight? Well, the amount of material that we actually will use determines how much we're actually going to have to charge because of the fact that the material cost goes up when you use more of it. I kind of want to talk to you about construction first because to me when i start out working on a design i'm thinking much about the construction if i know who this wheel is intended for i don't want to make a construction that's going to be over the cost or under the results that somebody's going to be looking for when they're looking to purchase that wheel so when it comes down to uh developing a wheel let's say i'm making a wheel that i want to be uh, more affordable and done for the masses I want it to look good. I'm not as concerned as how much it weighs per se, and I really want it to be easier on the wallet, then I will choose to go with a traditional casting technology. We have a few different versions. It could be low pressure, uh, it could be gravity. There's a bunch of different pros and cons to each, and we don't have to get into that right now, but each one will come with a different cost, but it will also allow me to make a wheel that is gonna be more affordable, and it will have a little bit more material, but usually the material cost won't outdo the price versus a construction. Because if I really wanted to make a wheel extremely light, I can use other constructions besides traditional casting. I can go to something like a flow forming. And that tightens up the grain structure of that aluminum. And when it does that, we're getting extra strength out of that barrel. So that's a, that's a process that we can utilize to be able to lower the weight. But the extra time it takes to actually flow form a wheel, that's what drives the cost up. So we have to just consider how we're applying it and how we're using it. And then how does that factor into the total cost of a wheel? We can do that same type of analysis when we go into a forge wheel. So when it comes to forging, this is where so much more time goes in versus the weight. So that starts to fall away, right? To get that light weight, what we're doing is we're taking a piece of aluminum and we're pressing it to 10,000 tons. And when we do that, we have the process time now in developing that piece. Then we have to actually put it up on a CNC and cut the design out. And that may take eight hours per wheel, maybe more sometimes, depending on how much detail. But when we remove that excess material, yes, we get a lightweight wheel, but we have more hours into this wheel than anything else. And that's why, as much as I say that weight can influence the cost by having too much weight, uh, it also, for us to drive that weight drastically down, and using construction methods to get there can increase the cost by just so much. So the Koenig brand has always been really focused on making sure that whatever product level we're offering, whether it be cast, flow form, or forged, that we're doing it as affordably as possible. Sometimes the tooling can have a major effect on what that cost is because somewhere in the cost of a wheel is gonna be all the tooling and prerequisites that come with the development of that wheel. 
So if we have to make different molds to make different sizes, we have to think about who are the people that are actually gonna get these wheels and are we gonna be able to make enough wheels to justify the tooling so we can keep the cost down? So on any given day, if you were going to our social media and look at a picture of a wheel that we would have posted, you're gonna see comments that are inevitable basically saying something to the effect of, how come you don't make this wheel for my car? Or if you made it in this size, you would sell a million of these things. Now, look, maybe you're right. And sometimes I'm not gonna say that we don't miss the boat on something. However, we have a lot of experience and a lot of feedback and a lot of research that we've learned how to do over the past you know, 45 years. And in that time, we usually get pretty close because our goal here is to make as many wheels as possible in that particular size or uh, fitment so that we can drive the cost down. So in that supply and demand thing also comes the thought process that we have to figure out what cars it's gonna be for and what fit type they're actually gonna be running. An example of this might be a 350Z because in the rear of that vehicle, maybe somebody's looking to run something aggressive and that's 18 by 11 at a 15 offset. And others may be like, I wanna run a nine and a half at a 25. The problem is those are two different wheels. Those are two different fitments. Those are two different sizes. Those are two different SKUs and most likely in many cases gonna be two different molds. And if that happens, you have to think about, well, how many wheels am I really gonna sell in each one of these SKUs or each one of these uh, sizes? Because that's gonna impact the cost of that wheel. And we have to think about all of this before we ever even make the wheel, because that will determine whether we should make the tooling to go along to make the wheel. And that probably is some of the most difficult things that we have to think about because there's so many fitments we want to make. I mean, in theory, we want to make a wheel that be able to work on every single vehicle and never have to tell somebody no. But by doing so, every time you'd have a fitment that didn't sell as well, you would basically either have to raise the cost or you would lose a grip of money. Losing a grip of money, unfortunately, this is a business and we have people like the good people behind the camera here that are recording that we have to keep employed. And that's another thing. Understanding you know, how this cost all ties into everything that goes into it, service, cost, materials, shipping, customer support, it's all there. And so it, it's something we don't really love to like have to think about all the time, but it is part of a design. And it's something that can complicate some of the decisions that end up being in the final product. All right, so before we wrap up here, there is kind of something I should kind of bring up. And when it comes down to bringing a wheel to production, we could do all the testing in the world before we actually get the wheel made. But once we get into actually manufacturing the wheel, we've made the tooling and now we're going to production, we do test runs. And those test runs are designed to find any little problem area that may be with the design. Because if you're gonna find a problem, it's gonna happen the first time that you run the wheels. It's gonna happen the first time you make the wheel. So we do this preemptively with all these wheels, we'll end up getting scrapped. We go ahead and we, we check everything. We make these wheels in a prototype but a batch sense to be able to understand exactly how everything will work, be able to tweak things if it's not right, adjust things. And again, these are wheels all go to physical testing to make sure that all the data, homework, FEA, everything we've done to this point is spot on and these things all pass and we do that. And once we have that all cataloged, now we can make a decision if we have to modify the process, modify the mold, modify the design, the paint mixture, whatever it's gonna be, and then we can bring a wheel into production. All right, so my intent for today was not to let you listen to me talk for a while, but it was to be able to give you a glimpse of what goes into making a wheel and complications that kind of plague us during this process. I hope that it will help answer a lot of the questions that I see on social media and some of the things that people argue about, but maybe don't know all the nuances that go into them. And again, this was an extremely honest view, but I don't think you can think that we bring you anything else. I think we have a track record of bringing you honesty and transparency so, so I hope you found this interesting. Uh, if you did, go ahead and uh, throw a like, hit that subscribe button, all that good stuff. And if you have any other questions, throw them down below. Thanks. Catch you in the next one.